this beachfront Verbo is about to become part of an unforgettable vacation memory. The moment when so much anticipation, and maybe just a little craziness, finally gets the room to run. But this moment didn't begin with a mad dash. It began with a tap, when the family booked their summer vacation early on Verbo. Your together awaits. Book early, cancel if you need to. Good morning, everybody, Uneducated Economist here. So I was reading this article last night talking about the trade deficit, the widening trade deficit that the United States is going through, and it really got me thinking about some stuff. And um, I thought I'd share this idea with you because there's a lot of stuff taking place right now, both like crazy things happening inside of the labor market and this widening trade deficit at the same time we have this de-dollarization and the Federal Reserve promising to keep interest rates low. And if you add all this stuff together, it really starts painting a crazy picture for deflation. And I know a lot of people are just probably rolling their eyes when I say that because I have talked so much about this kind of stuff and I should just probably let it go. But I tell you, when these things are on my mind, I can't. I just, I have to put it out here. So now let's think about this for just a second. Google Fi, a phone plan by Google. Meet Simply Unlimited, our most affordable plan for unlimited data, calls, and texts. Rate start is low. We have a widening trade deficit with the rest of the world. During the Trump administration, the trade wars, there was this promise to shrink the trade deficit with China. That happened, but it shifted from China to the rest of the world. So we're still importing a lot of stuff. And when you import more than you export, those are dollars leaving the country. So now I think about the de-dollarization like you're hearing from like Russia where they don't want to deal with the dollar anymore, no more imports or exports using dollar. Well, if the imports are coming into the country and those dollars are leaving the country, those people have to go somewhere with those dollars. I mean, they got dollars in their hands now. They just sold a bunch of stuff to the United States. Now, typically, they would want to go back into the United States and buy the bonds, but they're worried about inflation and the yields on the bonds are too low for them. So now, they have to go somewhere with that money. And if they're not going to buy the U.S. bonds, well, then they have to buy the debt of some other foreign nation. They don't have to, but, you know, holding on to cash is a no-no, so you got to go somewhere with it. So they buy the debt of a, another foreign nation. Well, now that foreign nation has the dollars. What do they do with it? Well, that gets me thinking about the euro dollar. Nations and corporations all around the world have wrote debts in dollars. They borrow money using dollars. They get the best interest rate. They do it in U.S. dollars, which means at some point they need to pay them back in U.S. dollars. And there's far more debt than there is dollars in circulation. So now I think about it. This foreign nation has just sold their, their, their products to the United States, received cash, bought the debt of some other foreign nation, right, because they don't want to hold on to cash. Now they have the cash. This cash has to go somewhere. And if you're not going to invest it back in the United States because you're worried about inflation, well, then you're probably just going to pay off your debts. So now I thought about that. If they start paying off the debts, well, that's deflation. See, de-dollarization really means deflation, right? Because unless you plan on investing back into the United States by buying their bonds or buying overinflated real estate or overinflated stocks, then you're going to have to pay off your debts. It's the, you know, there's no better return on your capital than to pay off a debt. Now, 
Let's say they don't. Let's say they do invest back into the United States. Well, let's say they buy a bunch of bonds and buy a bunch of stocks and buy a bunch of real estate. Well, then the United States happens to have interest rates rise. Crashing all these systems. Bonds go down, the real estate goes down, the stock market goes
Since middle school, I have been single-minded about money management. My mission? To make a platform where there is no mystery. Holy smokes, everyone. I've just found out some crucial, crucial information that explains exactly why the stock market has been selling off the past few weeks, exactly why there's been so much weirdness and so much volatility in the stock market as of late, and it shows what the insiders and the smart money is doing, and it shows what the dumb money is doing. The stock market over the past year has been absolutely flying. It's at all-time highs. People have been making huge amounts of money, but unfortunately, the party has to come to an end. In this video, I'm going to be going over some new breaking information, a shocking report from the Bank of America that proves exactly why the stock market as of late has been falling. Okay, let's get into it. So have a look at this, everyone. Hedge fund selling hits record as flows echo extreme levels of August at the open. That's right. Hedge fund selling pressure has never been higher since records began in 2008. So what do the hedge funds and the smart money the people in Wall Street know that the retailers don't know? Let's have a closer look. So obviously we know Janet Yellen said some comments about interest rates and inflation, and that really spooked the market to send the stock markets plummeting. But then she came back on record, took all her words back and said, no, I never said that, even though she did say that. She literally said uh, the economy is going to overheat and we may have to look at uh, lifting interest rates or that the stimulus packages uh, that they're doing is going to raise rates. But the actual hedge funds started selling off before this was announced. And institutional investors remain wary when the stock market is at all-time highs. They're not wanting to put their money in because really it's only dumb money that puts their money in when the stock market is at all-time highs. And this was also clarified in the Bank of America's report with a survey from its clients. Listen to this, everyone. In its weekly look at flows, Bank of America says clients were net sellers of US stocks. They sold $2.2 billion for a third week in a row. This is just one bank's clients. I can imagine all the other hedge funds or all the clients with the other major banks are doing the same thing. So hedge funds were net sellers for the fifth straight week and four week moving average of hedge fund flows fell to a record low since data started during the financial crisis. That's right, this is a record everyone. So this should ring alarm bells in your head and say, okay, you know, it may be time to look at my stock portfolio. Uh, maybe the money printer goes through is not gonna happen forever or that's not gonna lift my stock start, you know, 10, 15, 20% over the next year. Look at this chart everyone. Look at this chart, this red circle here, that's what's happening right now. There is huge, huge amounts of selling pressures by the hedge funds. They're selling billions and billions in stocks. But what do they keep coming out saying? No, just keep buying. Warren Buffett keeps coming out and saying, no, just keep buying even though he was a net seller in 2020. People, Wall Street at the end of the day, they always win. They'll sell at the top, they'll lure in all the retail investors. It just happens time and time again. And I don't know why people don't learn from history. It what What is happening right now, it literally happened the exact same in 2000 and in 2008, but human emotion, people just can't control themselves. Human emotion makes us go towards pleasure and makes us go away from pain. So when everything's going up, people wanna to go towards that pleasure. But when there's great opportunities, when there is a stock market crash, and when there is a stock market crash, I'm gonna be loading the truck of a 50% stock market crash they do the opposite and they run for the exit because that's human nature. It wants us to run away from pain. So you always have to go against that human nature and that human instinct and do opposite against what the herd is doing. Listen to this. Bank of America strategist led by Jill Carey Hole wrote in a note, the only other time flows with this extreme was at the end of last August, after which the S&P 500 declined by 2.5% and 2.3% in the subsequent one and four weeks retrospectively. And that is literally what is happening right now. And also institutional investors were net sales for the third week in a row. But of course, it says here, retail investors remain the resilient group net buyers for the 10th week in a row and the only net buyers for the third week in a row. Because what they do all the time, retail investors, they always buy the top and the insiders that have the insider information, they're selling at the top. But what exactly are they selling? So selling was most pronounced in the cyclical and growth sectors, like the high tech stocks. Tech is getting wrecked right now because they have very high price to earnings ratios. But now that the economy is reopening and things are going back to normal and people are getting out there off their phones, off the technology, 
then tech stock earnings may be weak. Have you ever heard of a coffee shop millionaire? You know, the people you see relaxing at the coffee shop and working on their laptops all day, but then you see them leave and they drive off in a quarter million dollar sports car. You ever want to know how they may be weaker? Also, With Fundrise, the same kind of real estate investments that have powered the world's strongest portfolios for decades are now available to What's up, everybody? Welcome to Heresy Financial. My name is Joe Brown, and today we are talking about two different sets of laws that apply to sound money like gold and silver and fiat money like dollars that we use today. Now, recently over the past 10 years or so, there has been a move within various states across the United States of America to push for legal tender laws that make gold and silver legal tender again in that state. So far, only three states have been successful with this, but the legislation has been presented in states all around the country and other states as well are taking smaller steps by eliminating sales tax and by eliminating capital gains taxes on gold and silver inside the states as well. And so this brings up the question, a lot of people look at this and say, hey, if we can get this applied across the nation, if we can get legal tender laws established, basically a return to what the constitution says about money, that would save our financial system and we could start using gold and silver again. But we have another law that's kind of opposed to this, and it's not a legal law in the sense of like a legal tender law where government writes a law and says, hey, this is how things are gonna be. We have another law, it's more of a natural law, it's called Gresham's Law, which basically says that good money is driven out, is pushed away, is pushed out of the system by bad money. So we're gonna look at how these two forces oppose each other and which one is more likely to be the driver to reestablishing sound money and giving our financial system firm footing once again. Ready? Let's dive in. A lot of people don't know this, but the best way to make money with Amazon in 2021 is not by selling physical products on Amazon like everyone thinks. 
All right, so right now, like I said, there are three states that have currently passed legal tender laws saying gold and silver are legal tender in that state. That is Utah, Louisiana, and Texas. The legislation is continuously being presented to state governments all across the country, and some states are getting close. And so many are taking this as a sign that it's only a matter of time before most, if not all, states across the country pass some sort of legislation like this. Now, the thinking is, if in a state it is now legal, it is now allowed for you to use gold and silver as legal tender, as payments for goods, services, and especially as debt, this paves the way then for the free market to step in and start to uh, accept payments and contracts in gold and silver instead of denominated in dollars. This is a return to what the U.S. Constitution says, which the U.S. Constitution specifically says that no state is allowed to make anything but gold and silver coin legal tender for payment to debt. Now, obviously, the Constitution is completely ignored here nationwide because rule of law is basically a joke, right? But the Founding Fathers were very intentional about the way they wrote this out because they had all lived through hyperinflation through fiat currencies. If you've ever heard the term not worth a continental, it's because all the Founding Fathers lived through hyperinflation of the continental that was printed, it was overprinted, in order to pay, help pay for the Revolutionary War. In fact, one of the things said about the hyperinflation in that period by Palladio Webster, I have no idea how to pronounce his name. But Webster said, paper money polluted the equity of our laws, turned them into engines of oppression, corrupted the justice of our public administration, destroyed the fortunes of thousands who had confidence in it, enervated the trade, There is one 
simple method that's proven to make a significant return from investing in the market. As you know, finding a method that really works among the countless other methods at Hello and welcome to Gold and Silver Assets. I'm Diora and it's Sunday the 2nd of May 2021. Could silver be worth as much as gold? Now some might say this is a completely preposterous notion, but believe it or not, it, there have actually been episodes in history where such a thing has occurred. So it's really not impossible. So here we're talking about the gold-silver ratio being historically low. Could such a low ratio occur again? And if so, what are the factors that could cause it to occur? When it comes to the gold-silver ratio, the first thing we need to clarify is which specific ratio we're talking about. Within the Earth, silver is 19 times more prevalent than gold. However, when it comes to extracting the metals, nine times more silver is mined than gold. Now, these ratios are relatively static, but when it comes to pricing, two ratios exist, and these are actually dynamic. The physical price ratio is currently around 55. But of course, when people are talking about the gold-silver ratio, they're usually referring to the paper price ratio, which is currently around 66. And it's this ratio that I'm going to be discussing here. Looking at the history of this ratio can be informative, and we can divide it into four main eras. We can see that during the bimetallic standard, when both gold and silver were considered monetary metals, the ratio was very stable, averaging 15. The demonetization of silver in 1873 saw a rise in the ratio with an average value of 30. The end of the classical gold standard saw a huge fluctuation in the gold-silver ratio with a range of 17 to 97. And then the fiat era has seen even larger swings in the ratio from 15 to 120. Let's have a closer look at those swings in the fiat era. This chart shows that in the fiat era, there are two sub eras. So one over here and one over here. And within those eras, the ratio appears to swing up and down between a roof and a floor. So in the inflationary 1970s here, the ratio moved between 18 and 48. But from around 1990 to today, the ratio has mainly swung between a floor of 45 and a roof of around 80. If we look more closely, we can see that it's taken between around two to five years for the ratio to go from its maximum peak to its ultimate trough here, 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 and here, shown in red. We can also see that there are numerous upswings on the way down, and the majority of time is spent in the mid-range. Also, times at the peak and trough values are usually quite brief, so they're, they're kind of spike up or down. So what's the ratio telling us right now? Well, the first thing to note here is that last year, the ratio reached a historical extreme high, and it's since dropped very rapidly towards the mean. In fact, it's been one of the fastest declines, and the ratio clearly remains in a downtrend. So history suggests that
everybody, Economic Ninja here. Uh, before I start talking about real estate, I just want to say uh, down in the description below is a bunch of bots. I will never try and get you to go to my WhatsApp account. I don't even have a WhatsApp account. I want to ask you for money. All the affiliate links are in the description. It helps out the channel. But uh, hopefully those are links that help you get to the right location, get the right deal. Some of those affiliate links, we split the, uh, the bonuses. But I don't ever try and ask you for your money. So that's just know that. That's not me. They're spammers. Real estate. I am getting a ton of questions about real estate. People ask the ninja, they said, look, if, if you see another real estate crash coming, which I do, right? And you know what? Let's explain that first. The reason why I believe that a downturn of real estate is coming is first off, we always have emotional and fundamental peaks and valleys in every market on earth. There's nothing new under the sun, okay? What you have to understand is that this speculation, this bubble that has been built up in the housing market has happened because of two reasons. First off, super low interest rates. These interest rates are lower than when the housing boom of 2004 to 2002 to 2005 happened, okay? Back then when houses peaked out and we just crossed over the median home price a little way, a few months back, um, we just crossed over that high, but back then that high was built on a normal mortgage rate of between five and 6%. Now we just crossed over that high with a normal mortgage rate of between uh, two and a half to three and a half percent. That is astonishing that people don't understand what's going on. That means to pump up the housing prices from the lows of 2010 to where they are now, it took, it, it, it needed half of the interest rate to make it happen, which means people have that less money as far as monthly income to shell out in the form of a mortgage payment, okay? Now, do I believe houses are gonna go up a little bit more? I do. That's very hard for some people to understand because like, well, how can you say it's crashing and how can you say it's gonna go up more? What you have to understand is in the beginning of a tulip mania, or an emu mania, or any kind of mania there is. There's these multiple stages of emotion that happen on the way up and on the way down. And we are still not at that peak, that euphoria. We're getting super close. And what it's gonna take is rates to go negative. And that's another thing that is very hard for people to understand. There is over 18 trillion in, excuse me, worldwide mortgage, or not mortgage, but worldwide debt that is in the negative territory. There are mortgages in other parts of the country, very small amount of mortgages, but they are actually negative. The actual mortgage rate is a negative percentage. That is very, very hard for people to understand. Now, I wanna explain this. Negative rates cannot last forever, okay? It will pop. I want to remind people, because people tell me all the time, well, look what Jerome Powell is saying, that there's not an issue, or, okay. If you had survived, not only the 2008 crisis, but like me was selling all my homes, in 2006, there was a mortgage crisis. And if you wanna go back and Google Ben Bernanke 2006, addressing the nation, he had multiple appearances.
Managing your money has typically been complicated, time-consuming, and costly, but you deserve better. M1 is the finance super app that's making money management easier and smarter than ever before. Here are five reasons why I love M1. M1 gives you all the freedom you need for your medium or That's why I do talking about capitalism, being a libertarian, and I want to go over that in this video. So what is Amazon up to? I guess the first thing I need to say is I'm not a financial advisor, so this is not to be taken as financial advice or fact in any way, shape or form, just my opinion. What I think Amazon is up to, just to get to the point, I think that they are trying to replace the postal service. And I don't mean that in a light way. And I'm going to go into detail on just how big this could be and how much it makes sense. I'm a capitalist. I'm a libertarian. I believe in free market capitalism. That's what I stand for. So. When Amazon is, you know, using tactics to get wildly ahead of its competition, there's a large part of me that goes, you know, right on. That's competition. Now, they're getting so big at this point. Um, there's a difference between competition and monopolies. And, you know, there's that because that's subject for a different conversation. But the largest thing that I see Amazon doing right now, I don't know about you, but if you notice these upgraded um, kind of UPS looking cars that they have now, first it started out as these kind of like lower end vans and they still got some of those. But lately I'm seeing these really well made um, new cars Amazon's driving around and they have the Amazon logo on them, free marketing on these cars, right? But it gets a lot deeper than that. I mean, how many of us have used the postal service? I use them quite a bit, USPS. They have been driving around the same um, I want to say golf cart since I was a kid, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm in my late twenties. And when I remember when I was a kid, when I was 12, you know, I remember seeing these golf carts in the same one. And I'm like, wow, you know, at some point you think that they would upgrade that and put some more, uh, something, you know, tech savvy in there. What's the difference now is these Amazon drivers. I don't know if you, you've looked into this, uh, when you order from Amazon, but you can see when they're getting close to you to say, you know, deliver between two 15 PM and four 15 PM and around two 15, you can actually track the driver and it says nine stops away. And you can literally sit there and I'm like, why has the USPS not done this yet? Like how brilliant is this? I'm going to use them. Even if I, I like, it's cheaper to use Amazon than a lot of other companies. But if this other company has to use USPS, and I don't get the ability to watch my package come down the street. I want to use Amazon. So this is like a little tactical thing that they do where sometimes it's not even only about having the price advantage, which they seem to be winning there as well. But having a service that is so much more easy to use, trustworthy, you know, and being on the up and up with tech. And it seems like such a simple solution that USPS should have done five years ago. Having a driver take a photo of where they left the package, notifying you, shooting you an email right away that you they left a package for you. You know, there's so much talk about package theft going on. This is a big breakthrough, the things that Amazon is doing with, you know, their upgrades on the delivery process. So... It's like, let me get this straight. You have the best platform for sellers to have commerce, right? Then you have the warehouse, which you ship from yourself in your own cars and your tech. It
With Fundrise, the same kind of real estate investments that have powered the world's strongest portfolios for decades are now available to you. From properties generating income today. Hey, everybody. Hope you're having a good day. Uh, it's Uranium Day. I, I've got a Uranium update. Uh, I've been doing a lot of updates because I know we're kind of at a critical juncture for some of these companies. They're trying to break through these patterns. So I'm continuing to monitor it. And you know, if this stuff interests you guys, uh, click subscribe to the channel. Let me know what you guys think. Put it in the comments section. Uh, but let's look at some of the chart patterns. This is Uranium. I'm going to go through a couple of things here uh, just to get everybody up to speed on where we're at real time. So this is Uranium. I'm sure I've left out some companies, no, no worries. Uh, so this is a, an update. We're gonna go straight to the charts. We're looking for psychological containment breaks, uh, basically chart patterns. And this is only financial education. Whatever you guys decide, you gotta do your own due diligence and see if these companies are right for you. I wanna start with the CRB index. Very large. Uh, this is the last bull market in 08 where it ended. Big downtrend line in this disinflationary, uh, very disinflationary period over here. And look what we've got. We've got a chart break to the upside for the entire commodity complex. And I'm sure some of you guys don't know this because you just are so focused on uranium itself. Uh, but this is important to know the big picture. Commodities are going higher. Uh, usually that means that the dollar is getting weaker. And that is a tailwind to our sector, which is a commodity. This is the Uranium. Hey everyone, this is John from Simpler Trading. So I'm finishing up today and I just want to show you how I'm doing this year. Here we can take a quick look. You can see uh, my open PL and then my PL year to date. This is the uranium price on a big long term perspective. We're in this upward channel and we're going to attack this downtrend line, which is next. We've got to break through this guy. So that's where we're at uranium price wise. This is zoomed in. We've got this pattern coming through. We got to break through it. Um, but the lows are, it's higher lows stepping on up and higher highs. So that's good. We're in an uptrend. Here's uranium North Shore Global um, Uranium Mining Index or ETF, I should say. We came on up, hit our head, hit our head. We popped through. We could see a pullback to back test this guy. Uh, that is very common to do. Uh, but again, I don't know the path. I can tell you we broke out to the upside of this. It's looking good. Uh, and don't expect, you know, don't just expect straight movements up. We could, this is a little day, you know, um, a higher opening price than the closing price, but still was an up day. That's what the black candlestick means. We could pull back a little bit uh, tomorrow uh, before heading higher or a day or two. It, we'll see what happens. Here's Camco, 